The main objective of this presentation is to give a general idea about the district cooling system and its various components. In this presentation, we are going to discuss about Refrigeration cycle Various types of cooling systems General process of a district cooling plant And, various components of a district cooling plant Refrigeration is the process of chilling or cooling a space or a substance. For example, sweat on our body evaporates by absorbing heat from the body surface and we feel a sensation of cooling. In this case, sweat acts as a natural refrigerant. In an air conditioner or chiller, refrigerants are usually chemical compounds with specific characteristics and it usually cools the secondary fluid which in turn is used to cool the space. Low boiling point High critical temperature and high latent heat vaporization are the main characteristics of a refrigerant. Well, let us now discuss various stages of a refrigeration cycle. Please have a look at the below diagram. The refrigerant passes through a closed loop. The four components of the refrigeration cycle are evaporator, compressor, condenser, and expansion valve. In general, evaporator cools the secondary fluid. The compressor compresses the refrigerant. Compressed refrigerant gets cooled down by the condenser fluid in the condenser. The cold and condensed refrigerant passes through the expansion valve before reaching the evaporator again so that the cycle repeats. Let us look into each part closely in the coming slides. The refrigerant at low pressure and temperature enters the evaporator. The secondary fluid also enters the evaporator. The refrigerant evaporates by absorbing heat from the secondary fluid. Hence, the secondary fluid gets cooled. Vapor refrigerant leaves the evaporator and circulates to the compressor. Chilled secondary fluid leaves the evaporator and is used for cooling the space. Please note that the refrigerant and the secondary fluid are separated by evaporator coil surface. Hence it does not mix with each other. The hot vapor refrigerant from the evaporator enters the compressor. The compressor compresses the refrigerant. Compressed and superheated refrigerant leaves the compressor and enters the condenser. Compressed and superheated refrigerant from the compressor enters the condenser. Cold condenser fluid, which is either water from the cooling tower or atmospheric air, also enters the condenser. Condenser fluid absorbs heat from the superheated refrigerant and leaves the condenser. The refrigerant after giving away its heat to the condenser fluid gets cooled down and condenses into liquid form. High pressure refrigerant in cold liquid form leaves the condenser and enters the expansion valve. As discussed in the previous slide, the refrigerant and the condenser fluid are separated by the condenser coil surface. Hence it does not mix with each other. High pressure refrigerant in cooled liquid form from the condenser circulates through the orifice inside the expansion valve. Expansion valve regulates the refrigerant volume that passes to the evaporator, which is proportional to the superheat sensed after the evaporator. The refrigerant at low pressure and low temperature in vapor liquid form enters the evaporator. This cycle thus repeats over and over again until no more cooling is required by the user. Please note that this refrigeration cycle is more or less typical for all types of cooling systems. The major change will only be the type of secondary fluid and condenser fluid, which we will be discussing in the upcoming slides. Now, let us look into various types of cooling systems. The first type is the direct expansion cooling units, such as window AC and split AC. Next is, air-cooled and water-cooled chillers. Last type is the district cooling system, which is the same but advanced version of chillers. We will look into each type of cooling system in detail in the coming slides.
In a direct expansion cooling unit, air from the space, is circulated with the aid of a fan over the evaporator coils, and heat is exchanged with refrigerant. In this type of cooling system, cooling is directly between cooling unit and the air from the space. Direct expansion cooling systems are used to cool small rooms. Condenser and compressor units are either kept outside the partition wall of the room or kept facing the outside area. Whereas, evaporator and expansion valve are either kept inside the room or kept facing the indoor area. Room air passes through evaporator coils, with the help of a motor fan, and gets cooled. Outdoor air at atmospheric temperature, passes through condenser coils with the help of a motor fan, and cools the refrigerant. Window AC is placed through an opening in the partition wall of the room. Evaporator and expansion valve faces the room. Condenser and compressor faces the outdoor area. In a split AC, the outdoor and indoor units are kept separately, rather than through an opening in the partition wall. Evaporator and expansion valve are kept inside the room as indoor unit. And condenser and compressor are kept outside the room as outdoor unit. These indoor and outdoor units are interconnected through insulated tubes. Now, let us discuss about the second type of cooling system, chillers. In high-rise buildings, few chillers are used for the cooling purpose, instead of hundreds and thousands of direct expansion cooling units. Mass production of cooling will result in benefits like enhanced efficiency, easy maintenance, flexibility for upgradation, reduced pollution and less carbon footprint etc. Water in large quantity, will be cooled in the chiller evaporator, by heat exchanging with the refrigerant. Water thus cooled, will be circulated through all floors of high-rise building, and space will be cooled with the aid of air handling units, and fan coil units. In a chiller, water gets circulated through evaporator coil. The refrigerant inside the evaporator, cools this water by absorbing its heat. Chilled water thus produced, will be sent to building floors, for cooling the space. The condenser fluid is either, cold water from the cooling tower, or atmospheric air. Let us look into the chiller evaporator in detail. Water, in large quantity will be cooled in the evaporator, by heat exchanging with the refrigerant. Chilled water thus produced, will get circulated from evaporator to air handling units, and fan coil units in all floors or rooms of the building, with the aid of pumps. Hot air in the room, enters the air handling unit or fan coil unit, and exchanges heat with chilled water circulating through the cooling coil. Cold air leaves the air handling unit or fan coil unit, and cools the space. Hot water leaves the air handling unit or fan coil unit, and returns to the evaporator. As discussed in the previous slides, the refrigerant in the chiller condenser is either cooled by atmospheric air, or cold water from the cooling tower. In an air-cooled chiller, refrigerant in the condenser is cooled by atmospheric air, with the aid of fans. The picture below shows, various components of an air-cooled chiller. In a water-cooled chiller, water from the cooling tower gets circulated through the condenser coil, and absorbs heat from the refrigerant, and dissipates this heat back into the cooling tower. Let us discuss this in detail in the next slide.
Condenser water from the cooling tower absorbs heat from the refrigerant in the condenser. Hot condenser water circulates to the cooling tower and gets sprinkled from the top. Condenser water exchanges heat with circulated atmospheric air in the cooling tower with the aid of cooling tower fan. Cold condenser water gets settled in cooling tower basin and pumps again to the condenser with the aid of condenser water pump. When this cycle repeats, the condenser water which is in contact with atmospheric air gets contaminated. Side stream filtration system filters the condenser water from the cooling tower. However, when this contamination raises beyond a limit, a portion of the condenser water is blown down or rejected, and an equivalent amount of fresh water will be added as makeup. Now, let us go through the pictures of various components discussed so far. Final type of cooling system we are going to discuss is, district cooling systems. Instead of separate chillers in every building in a community, chilled water is produced in large chillers in a central plant located in the community. And it is circulated through underground insulated pipes to every building. Water thus circulated, exchanges heat with building chilled water system through plate heat exchangers. Building water thus cooled will be circulated through all floors of high-rise building and space will be cooled with the aid of air handling units and fan coil units. Large-scale production of chilled water in a district cooling system thus brings in few benefits. Let us list out a few of them, such as Higher efficiency and reliability Due to increased efficiency, there will be energy savings and proportional cost savings for the building owner. The building owner can use the saved space for business, which were otherwise utilized by chillers and cooling towers. Reduced pollution and carbon footprint due to enhanced efficiency of large-capacity water-cooled chillers. There will be more flexibility for the upgradation of equipment. Maintenance will be easier than in a building to a greater extent. The noise level in the buildings will get reduced due to the absence of chillers and cooling towers. The major difference between a chiller system and district cooling system is the extended chilled water network in the district cooling system. The below diagram shows the various components of a district cooling system. Please note that the dotted line represents the underground pipe network between the district cooling plant and the buildings, whereas the dark line represents the pipe network inside the district cooling plant. Let us look into each component separately in coming slides. As discussed in the chiller slides, secondary fluid, that is, water gets cooled in the evaporator, and chilled water leaves the chiller evaporator. Secondary chilled water pumps circulate the chilled water from the chiller evaporator to the chilled water pipe network, at the required flow rate, based on the cooling load requirement from the buildings. The chilled water circulated through insulated underground pipes, reaches plate heat exchangers in the building, and absorbs heat from building chilled water system. 
Thus, the building chilled water gets cooled. This cold building water is pumped to every floor or room of the building with the aid of building pumping system. Building air handling unit and fan coil unit convert this into cold air for cooling the space. Hot water from the plate heat exchanger returns to the district cooling plant through underground pipes. The amount of load supplied to a particular building is calculated using BTU meter as shown below. Load is equal to flow multiplied by delta T. Flow is calculated using a flowmeter and delta T is the temperature difference between supply and return water obtained through temperature sensors. PICV in the return line of each building controls the chilled water flow to the heat exchanger as per the refrigeration load requirement, which is independent of pressure in the line. Let us go through the pictures of these components. The construction stage picture below shows insulated supply and return pipes, which are laid underground. In the plate heat exchanger shown below, we can see the provisions provided with yellow caps for the supply and return water line from the district cooling plant and from the building. Please note that these water channels are separated by alternate plates in the heat exchanger and hence, these water channels do not mix with each other. A typical PICV with its valve actuator mounted on top of it. The chilled water supplied to the building sides absorbs heat from the building water system. This hot water from the plate heat exchanger reaches the district cooling plant through underground pipes. If there is any water loss due to leakages or other construction activities, the same amount of water shall be topped up in the system. Either fresh water from the main water supply shall be provided. or treated sewage effluent, generally from the Irrigation Department of Municipality, will be taken for cost savings. This TSE water will be filtered through reverse osmosis and ultrafiltration methods. Chilled water makeup pump will circulate the required amount of makeup water in the loop to maintain the required pressure. Unpurified water from the RO plant will be rejected, usually to destined areas through tankers, or rejected directly to the municipality blowdown line. There will be an expansion tank, to accommodate the pressure loss or gain, which is due to the thermal expansion or contraction of the water in the loop. The below picture shows a type of expansion tank. A typical reverse osmosis unit. Hot water after necessary makeup will pass through air separators. Air separators remove the entrapped air in the water to increase the efficiency of the system. Chemical dosing system adds the required amount of chemicals to the water, which is usually corrosion inhibitors and biocides. Primary chilled water pumps will circulate the water to the evaporator of chiller, wherein the water exchanges heat with the refrigerant, and cold water will leave the evaporator to repeat the cycle. Sample picture below shows air separators. Typical chilled water chemical dosing system. As discussed in the previous slide, hot water then enters the chiller evaporator, wherein the water exchanges heat with refrigerant and becomes cold. Cold water leaves the evaporator and continues its cycle through the chilled water network to the buildings. The condenser water circuit repeats as explained in the previous slide. Please refer to slide number 22. Now, let us discuss the use of the decoupler line and thermal energy storage tank. When the primary pump flow is greater than the secondary pump flow, that is, when the load requirement attains or load requirement goes down, the excess flow is bypassed through the decoupler line. Please note that, the decoupler line is also known as bypass line. In some countries, 
During the peak load, usually midday, the cost for electrical energy is higher. In such scenarios, thermal energy storage tanks will be implemented for peak load shave off. When the cooling load requirement is lower, generally during midnight, more chillers will be operated and excess primary flow will be diverted through the decoupler line. The valve shown in the decoupler line will be closed and the flow will be through the TES tank. Hence, cold water will be stored in the TES tank. This process is called as TES tank charging. The next day, during the peak load condition, the TES tank will be discharged, while switching off equivalent numbers of chillers. The picture below shows a TES tank. We have covered the general process of a district cooling system and its various components. Now, let us discuss about few more components in a district cooling plant other than those we have discussed about in the previous slides. General electrical layout of a district cooling plant. Electrical power is distributed to the district cooling plant from the authority through underground or overhead electrical cables. Power distribution authority is different for different regions. It is Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, Dewa, in Dubai. Power is distributed through our MU units, which is part of the specific distribution system adopted by the Power Distribution Authority. For example, Ring Power Distribution System in Dubai. This medium voltage power is distributed to high capacity chillers through MV switchgears and soft starters. Switchgears are the devices used to control, protect and isolate electrical equipment where a soft starter is used to protect the electrical equipment by reducing the startup power supply. This medium voltage power is then stepped down to low voltage through transformers. Low voltage power is then distributed to low voltage rated equipments through low voltage switch gears. Power factor correction capacitor maintains the level of reactive power consumption, thereby reducing the electricity bill. Variable flow drive is the device used to control the speed of pump motors. Let us now check the other miscellaneous components in a district cooling system. As we already know, the major difference between a building chiller system and a district cooling system is the insulated chilled water pipeline, which is laid underground. This underground pipeline is maintained and controlled through valve chambers. Network valve chambers are used to house the below listed items, which are part of the underground pipe network. Valves, or loops, or flanges, which are kept as provisions for future connection. Valves, which are used to isolate main and distribution branches. Loops kept for flushing provision. Valves kept for isolating the house connections. Drain valves. Air vent valves, etc. 
We have discussed in slide number 32 that, BTU meter is installed in a building. Let us now see, which all places are equipped with BTU meters to monitor the energy transfer. Plant BTU meter. Delta T is calculated between, main supply and return headers. This is to calculate the overall refrigeration, supplied by the plant. Building bulk BTU meter. Delta T is calculated between, supply and return header to the building. This is to calculate the refrigeration supplied to the building. Submeter kept in each room of the building, to bill separately for each tenant. BTU meter for plant HVAC used to calculate the refrigeration supply to the district cooling plant HVAC system. TES tank BTU meter. Used to calculate TES tank charging and discharging refrigeration. UPS system. Uninterrupted power supply consists of charger, central battery system, and inverter, which supplies uninterrupted power during main source failure. Emergency light, emergency lift, firefighting sprinkler systems, PLC SCADA system etc. are also connected to central battery system. There are usually various types of firefighting systems, equipped in a district cooling plant. Fire hydrant. Trained firefighters connect their hose reels to the hydrants, to attack the fire with water. Fire extinguisher. There are several types of fire extinguishers like, carbon dioxide, foam, wick chemical, dry chemical powder, and water type. Used by occupants of the building to attack the fire. Type of fire extinguisher is chosen based on factors like, type of fire, source of fire etc. Fire hose reels. It is used by occupants or firefighters, to attack the fire. The water supply is from firefighting water tank in the building. Sprinkler system. When a fire happens, the sensor system triggers the water sprinklers automatically. FM200 fire suppression system. It is a waterless fire suppression system. Fire sensors trigger it automatically, in the event of fire, and its response time is very quick, so the damage to the properties is very less. It is generally used in the rooms, where critical assets are kept, most of the electrical rooms. Fire alarm control panel. Fire alarm control panel is used to monitor and control the fire and firefighting system. It is also connected to the region's firefighting authorities monitoring system to relay the fire alarm. For example, in Dubai, FACP is connected to Dubai Civil Defense's 24-7 smart monitoring system. IT and security related components. Access control system, which is either card or punching enabled access doors or automatic gate barriers, etc are used to restrict unauthorized entry to the building premises. CCTV system is cameras, along with recorder and monitor which is used to monitor around the building premises. PLC SCADA system. Programmable logic controller, along with supervisory control and data acquisition, is mainly used for below purposes. Track and analyze data like temperature, pressure, flow, position of valves, etc. Automate process and procedures, based on the above data. For example, increasing the frequency of secondary pump VFD, when the return line temperature increases. Or, selecting the chiller to operate, based on total run hour history, etc. Enable remote site monitoring and controlling. Overall enhancement of productivity. District Heating System District cooling systems are already prevalent in tropical countries, like UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, etc. District heating system is used in countries like Canada, US, UK, etc., where the ambient temperature is low. District heating system is similar to district cooling system. The major difference is that, 
chiller is replaced by boiler and district heating system. Finally, thank you for watching the presentation. Please provide your valuable feedback, suggestions for corrections, and any queries in the comments section.